14 minutes of even more cut content found in Fallout 3. During Fallout 3's development, Bethesda was originally planning a quest where the Enclave would attack and occupy Rivet City. The player would have had to escort all of the surviving inhabitants to the Citadel, where they would have settled for the rest of the game. The Enclave then would restore the Rivet City aircraft carrier and activate its weapons. According to a 2009 GameSpot article, the ambitious combat-intensive level eventually ended up being cancelled by Todd Howard because of technical difficulties and not having enough time to implement such a huge change in the game world. It was also originally planned for the player to be able to drive Liberty Prime while sitting in his head and lead an assault on the Enclave's occupied Rivet City, creating an epic battle between the 300-foot tall robot and the aircraft carrier with its engines and guns now back online. Found in the art of Fallout 3 are concept art pictures of a mutated James, the father of the lone wanderer. According to Emil Pagliarulo, one of the lead developers of Fallout 3, James's fate in the original script was far more grim. The player would have found him in Vault 87, where he would have been in the process of being turned into a mutant, and would beg his child to end his life. If the lone wanderer refused, he would turn into a full-fledged super mutant and attack his own kid. In Tenpenny Tower, Herbert Daring Dashwood, the retired adventurer, has an unused AI package where he would sneak in people's rooms in order to keep himself amused. I'm bored. Let's see if I can lighten things up around here. Dashwood, what the hell are you skulking about for? A bunch of voice lines still exist in the game files, where the other Tenpenny Tower residents would either catch Dashwood sneaking or talk amongst themselves about Dashwood's odd behavior. Daring, you're up to no good, aren't you? <laughs> naughty, naughty old man. Uh, hello there. Right. Um, don't mind me then. I'm, uh, just practicing my hunting skills. Keeps me young and all that. Right. Goodbye now. You're behaving rather oddly, Mr. Dashwood. Perhaps you should go lie down for a while. Ahem. <clears throat> Dashwood, don't do anything stupid. Mr. Dashwood, perhaps you should go take a nap, dear. You're acting rather peculiar. Have you seen the way Mr. Dashwood skulks about when no one's looking? He's up to something, I'm sure. But what on earth could he be doing? In the final game, Irving Chang complains that his computer keeps breaking every day and that he has to re-enter his communist ramblings. Well, as it turns out, Dashwood would have been the one breaking it by sneaking in Chang's room and erasing his terminal entries in order to mess with him. How's that manifesto of yours coming along, comrade? Well, comrade, my computer keeps breaking and I have to start over each day. Not to worry, though. I've got it practically memorized by now. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, Irving. Maybe I should take a look at your computer sometime. <laughs> The slaver found at the front gate of Paradise Falls, wearing combat armor, internally is named Richter. He was once meant to be involved in the replicated man's side quest, where at some point the player would have had to obtain a clue from him by demanding the slaver reveal the missing android's whereabouts. If the player character had evil karma, he would have directed you to Sister, another slaver living in Rivet City. Trail led to Rivet City. Sisters are inside, man. I think he's long given up looking for that android and is just living it up on that boat. According to some more concept art pictures created by Adam Adamovich, a unique mutated Brahmin variant was once considered, with a long creepy tongue, an empty eye socket, and a gigantic udder. There are also two alternative versions of Mr. Handy robots that would have looked a lot different from what we got in the final game, and an antique version that doesn't hover. A unique martini centaur seems to have been in the works as well, dressed in pre-war clothes and holding a drink. It sadly never left the concept phase, but but if it did, it would have made a great random encounter. Deputy Well, the Protectron guarding the front gate of Megaton, has unused model attachments that would have made him look a lot more unique. He was once planned to have a cool tattoo on one of his sides and a sharer's badge on the front. A cut unmarked quest named Matchmaker was once intended to take place in Canterbury Commons. It would have involved trying to get Derek Passion and Machete to start dating, both of whom secretly have a crush on each other. According to some of the script notes, the player would have needed to discover that Derek likes her by listening in on a conversation between him and Joe Porter. Hey Derek, you did some fine work out there with those Brahmin. Guess. 
I mean it. That's hard work. But you look like you got something on your mind. What's up? It's nothing. Just... You think Machete might like me? Oh, man. Just like when I was a kid. Maybe you ought to go talk to her, Derek. No. No, never mind. Pretend I didn't say anything. And do the same by listening in on Machete while talking to Dominic. All clear out there, Captain, sir. Whoa, calm down there. Attitude like that'll just get someone hurt. Plus, it puts the locals on edge. The locals could use a little scaring, sir. Bunch of fat, coward traitors. Lady, if you don't calm down, I'm going to let Derek know about your crush on him. That'll give you something else to think about. After overhearing both conversations, the player would have been able to give Derek dating advice, encouraging him to pursue Machete, which would have resulted in three possible outcomes. A good outcome, where Derek is nervous, but Machete agrees to go on a date with him. A smooth outcome, where Derek is charismatic, and Machete also agrees to go out. And a bad outcome, where Derek manages to anger Machete, making her reject him. Most of the dialogue for these scenes does not exist, apart from two hello lines from Derek to start the scene. Um, hi miss, I mean Machete. Things okay with the, um, guarding? Hey Machete, you on guard? I mean, of course you are. I mean, um, never mind. And three goodbye lines for both Derek and Machete to end it. Great, I'll see you later Machete. Good, see you later. And you better show up. No problem Machete, see you later. It's unknown what reward would have been received after completing this quest. When returning to Vault 101 during the Trouble on the Homefront quest, it was intended that the Vault's public announcement radio would play a unique message from the Overseer, threatening to use deadly force against the Rebels and dispense punishment towards anyone caught associating with them. If the Overseer is Alan Mack, this would have played. Any Vault resident seen associating with the so-called Rebels will be detained, questioned, and disciplined appropriately. Order will be restored. Discipline will be restored. Vault security personnel have been authorized to use deadly force if necessary. Don't let it come to that. This vault will be one big happy family again, one way or another. And if Amada's dad is still the overseer, this would have played instead. Any vault resident seen associating with the so-called rebels will be detained, questioned, and disciplined appropriately. Order will be restored. Discipline will be restored. Vault security personnel have been authorized to use deadly force if necessary. Don't let it come to that. Haven't you always been happy? Haven't we always been a, a family? Amata, stop this madness. You're disrupting everyone's life, everyone's happiness. Come home. Just come home. And everything can be the way it was. Sadly, we never get to hear these broadcasts in-game, and only static can be heard when returning to the vault. The Dark Heart of Blackhall side quest given to you by Obadiah Blackhall in the Point Lookout DLC was originally planned to play out a lot differently. For starters, instead of asking the player to find the Book of Krobatnia directly, Obadiah would have instead requested that a letter be delivered to Marcella, the nomad Christian missionary found in the Disaster Relief Outpost. This letter would have been a plea for help from Obadiah. Marcella, I'm not imagining it, they're getting closer with each passing night, the dogs are gone gone, or taken for sacrifice more like. I don't like to rely on superstition to keep them at bay, but there's no way I can fight them off if they take a mind to attack my home. I don't know who else to turn to, Marcella. I'm skeptical, but I think we may be able to trust this outsider to help. After delivering this letter to the missionary, she would have called Obadiah a good man with a family that has an evil past. Obadiah's a good man, but his family has an evil past. This book is an unwanted heirloom and the foundation of the heathen Kervibi ritualists. She would then give more information about the Krubeknya and the Krivibi ritualists, presumably a group of swamp folk in possession of the book. Long ago, the Blackhall family possessed a terrible heirloom, a book of evil rituals best forgotten. The Kervibi have their origins in it. The book was stolen years ago, Though the Kervibi have never known of the theft, their fear has kept the Blackhall family safe these long years. They'd never be so bold. That foul book is back in Point Lookout, and they must have it. We can't allow them to keep it. 
After retrieving the book, Marcella would have been found dead, just like in the released version. However, dialogue with Obadiah would have indicated that it was the Krivibi who had murdered her. He would react with shock at both Marcella's death as well as the presence of the book, which he had assumed was long gone after it was stolen years ago. You have it? God help us, you do. That damn book is back, and this time it'll be the death of me. He would have then explained that he is obligated to destroy it as the last black hall, and it can only be done by sacrificing himself. If prompted though, Obadiah would have suggested that there is actually one other way he could think of destroying the book, but it is beyond his abilities. At this point, the player would have been given the option of accepting the task and taking the Krivechnia to the obelisk housed in the Dunwich building in order to destroy it. In Vault 87, when talking to Fox for the first time through the intercom, an unused dialogue option was meant to appear that would have allowed you to insult his looks. It would have read, Yikes, I'd say whoever beat you with the ugly stick overdid it. Ah, your arrogance against my kind is hardly surprising. However, there is only so much even I can take. Please, I'm appealing to the positive side of your human nature. Can we have a civil conversation? Hamilton's hideaway located between Arafu and Big Town is a crude, unfinished bomb shelter now infested with rad roaches, rad scorpions, and raiders. Not much is really going on here, but at one point it was planned for the player to find a cut terminal that would have revealed that this underground complex was originally a well-prepared shelter for a family of three. It also described what the world was like a year after the bombs fell. First entry reads, July 19, 2077. Finally done. Maggie wanted us to sign up at a vault shelter, but I've never trusted those bastards. It took a lot of work, but Frank helped me get all the parts together and hauled out to the acreage to build this shelter. Air filtration, chemical toilets, artesian well, the whole nine yards. Frank's connections got us the generator cheap too, and we don't have to worry about sharing quarters with whoever got their name on some waiting list when the day comes. December 24th, 2077. Two months after the bomb Fell. Robin wanted to play with the computer for Christmas, so I siphoned some juice from the fusion generator to power this old thing. I know she'd rather be playing outside in the snow, but she's a good kid, knows that we can't go outside yet. I'll check the fallout levels again tomorrow while she's playing, but I doubt we'll be heading out anytime soon. Damn, commies must have hit us hard. February 13, 2078. Don't believe it, Frank showed up today. He was on a sales trip when the blast hit, selling generators to a mining operation in Pennsylvania. Being in those shafts probably saved his life, but the shockwave also knocked out every power line, feeding them light and air. Falling debris killed the foreman standing right next to him. He doesn't even know how long he was crawling around those tunnels before he got outside. The poor bastard. February 14, 2078. Frank's in bad shape. Arms and face are all burned up. He's got a lot of blisters that look infected. He went through hell out there. Hardly anybody alive, and those he met almost did him in. He tried getting into a vault near Burkittsville. They wouldn't open up, and he was almost killed in an ambush on his way out of there. He said those folks were skins of men, cannibals, must just wait for their next meal to come looking for help at the vault. Frank steered clear of them and headed straight here after that. He's been on his feet for weeks. February 28, 2078. His hair was falling out within a week of him showing up. I wanted to believe we could save him, but there's no way a few iodine tablets a day was going to reverse the radiation he must have been exposed to out there. He was a good man. He deserves better, but I can't go out there and give him a proper burial. Maggie's going to stay up with Robin and let her play some holotapes loud tonight. That's when I'll take Frank in the back and cremate him. I wish our furnace was big enough to hold him in one piece. God help us. How could it have come to this? 